Number three, Sir Robert Victor Goddard. Many so-called time travelers have reputations that often do not hold up under scrutiny. But such is not the case with Sir Robert Victor Goddard. That Sir, as in commander of the Order of the British Empire, a knight of the Order of Bath, and the Air Commodore Chief of the Air Staff of the Royal New Zealand Air Force. There are few who would not take Sir Robert at his word. By 1935, when Goddard returned to base after a mission with an incredible story, he decided not to test that assumption. His mission was to survey the condition of an old World War I airfield in Edinburgh, Scotland, and it wouldn't take long to complete. Landing his biplane amidst grazing cows and barbed wire fences, Goddard was quick to conclude that the overgrown airfield was in no condition to receive planes. So he settled back into the cockpit of his Hawker Hart biplane for the flight back to England. And that's when the storm blew in. Fierce winds and torrential rain pelted Goddard in his open air cockpit. The storm forced him to return to the rundown Scottish airfield. But as the pilot made his approach, he was shocked by what he saw. The dilapidated runway, the overgrown hangar, and the grazing cattle were gone. Instead, from his vantage point a hundred feet up, Goddard observed a fully operational, fully staffed, and fully armored working airbase. Checking his instruments, Goddard knew that this was the exact location of the overgrown airfield. Then, as the sun emerged from the storm clouds, Goddard was able to get a better view. But those clear skies only served to further his confusion. Down below, on the fresh blacktop runway, Goddard could plainly see a handful of busy mechanics working on planes wearing blue coveralls. Strange, Goddard thought, standard issue mechanics uniforms were khaki, not blue. Stranger still, the mechanics were repairing a type of plane that Goddard had never seen before. Instead of the two standard wings common in World War I, this plane only had one wing. Despite his years of experience and top secret clearance, Goddard had never seen anything like it. He had one more strange observance as he flew over the airfield. All the airplanes on the runway below were painted yellow. Yet, 1935 British military regulations required planes to be painted silver for camouflage. What was going on? Utterly baffled and mindful of his fuel gauge, Goddard flew back to England, where he mentioned his odd mission to a trusted comrade, who looked at him as if he had grown a third eye. It was then that Goddard decided to keep the experience to himself. Four years later, in 1939, Goddard had all but forgotten his stormy trip to Edinburgh until he is assigned a flight to Drum Air Force Base. Where is that? Goddard asks his superior. Edinburgh, Scotland, the commander replies. Goddard is confused, having reported four years earlier about its dilapidated condition. But the commander informs Goddard it has since been rebuilt and is now in full operation. Returning to Scotland, Goddard is flabbergasted to see the Drem tarmac full of airplanes, all painted yellow. The color, he's told by a mechanic, is a new primer paint used to prevent corrosion. It's then that Goddard noticed the man's coveralls. They're blue. They had been issued to all Royal Air Force mechanics in the past year, he's told. But what stuns Goddard more is the sight of one particular airplane. It's a monoplane, so-called due to it having one wing instead of two, and two cockpits instead of one. It's the Mile Magister Mark I, the mechanic says. And it's a plane Sir Robert Victor Goddard has never seen before, until he remembers he had. As a wing commander, Goddard had an encyclopedic memory when it came to planes. He can recall the name, capabilities, and history of any plane enemy or ally. I remember seeing one of those back in 1935, Goddard says. Impossible, the mechanic replies. It wasn't invented until 1938. 
Shaken by this response, Bedard looks out over the Scottish air base around him. Mechanics in blue overalls busily working on yellow airplanes, including a plane he had never seen before. Then, Goddard looks to the sky and wonders if some younger version of him is looking down at himself from the past. Number 2. Dr. E.G. Moon Edward Carson was feeling unwell. A celebrated career politician, he was a personal friend of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and holder of the title of Baron and later Lord Carson. But at 81 years old, time was finally beginning to catch up to Sir Edward. And so that's why, on a brisk and wet September day in 1935, Carson's concerned wife, Ruby, finally decided to call for a doctor. For his part, Dr. E.G. Moon was one of the most renowned physicians of his day. So successful was Dr. Moon that he owned one of the few automobiles in Kent, England. And it is this car, an Armstrong Sidley, that Dr. Moon drives to Sir Edward Carson's house on a fall day in 1935. Dr. Moon parks his car on the cobblestone street outside of Carson's estate, being careful not to scratch his door on some bushes along the curb. And then he heads indoors to examine the patient. Bed rest, Dr. Moon later tells Carson, to take Prontocell. There's a little more that can be done, Dr. Moon thinks to himself. Just an old man getting older. Still, before leaving for the road trip back home, Dr. Moon instructs Carson's nurse. Keep his spirits up, he tells her, and telegraph if things get worse. And with that advice, Dr. Moon bids goodbye, goes downstairs, and out into the street. Drat, he remembers. I forgot to write the prescription. And it is then that Dr. Moon looks over to his trusty Armstrong to find the vehicle has vanished. Stolen, he thinks. Damn. But then, before Dr. Moon can even think to call the police, things turn stranger still. Not only is the good doctor's car gone, so are the hedges. Those bushes he tried so hard not to scratch his door on. The ones by the curb. But then, the curb isn't there anymore either. Neither is the cobblestone street the curb ran along. The street now before his eyes is a dirt road turned muddy on this damp September day. Dr. Moon grows disoriented. His thoughts are pulled between the forgotten prescription, his car, and what he is seeing. So it's understandable, perhaps, that Dr. Moon also doesn't notice a man walking towards him walking with purpose, as if Dr. Moon is this man's urgent destination. And how oddly this man is dressed, Moon thinks. Aside from his bushy, munchop sideburns, he is wearing a black top hat. In England, in 1935, top hats had gone by the way of the corset in terms of fashion. And yet, this man was wearing one, along with a strange coat, which is long and loosely fitted. A sack coat, Dr. Moon remembers them being called. A coat that had gone out of style when Queen Victoria and Prince Albert ruled Britain during the previous century. As the man marches closer, it is then that Dr. Moon notices he's carrying a gun. It's a long musket-style rifle which the man has been shouldering and is now pointing at Dr. Moon. The physician's attention turns from the approaching man back to the house where the nurse calls after him as she runs down the stairs to the door. The nurse wonders about the Pronosil prescription for her employer. Of course, but as Dr. Moon gets his bearings, he looks back into the street, where his car, the bushes, and the cobblestone street had all returned, just as he remembered them. And the man with the rifle is gone too. Strange, Dr. Moon thinks. Very strange indeed. A month later, Dr. Moon receives word that Sir Edward Carson has passed away of old age. 81 years old, the doctor thinks, impressive to have lived that long in this day and age. The newspaper stated that the Honorable Sir Lord Edward Carson had been born in 1854. 
Strange, Dr. Moon thinks. 1854 was right around the time of sack coats and musket style rifles and top hats. Strange indeed. Number one, the man from Tarad. The young customs agent at the airport counter is drenched in sweat. It's a scorching July in Tokyo, Japan, and the international travelers have quadrupled since the U.S. occupation ended. It is 1954, after all, and Japan is, once again, open for business. Looking down the line of passengers, the agent thinks to himself, business must be booming. The agent sips some water, mops his brow, and calls the next person in the long line. Where are you coming from? he asks the man in Japanese. But the next man in line is Caucasian. He is also ghostly white and confused. He wears a rumpled suit, carries no luggage, and studies his surroundings with dismay. The man sputters in French. The agent tries to calm him with what little French he knows. But the man quickly switches to Japanese and speaks it fluently. Where is this place? he asks, bewildered. Wary, the agent waves over a nearby security guard. This is Haneda Airport, of course. May I see your passport? As the guard approaches, the strange man places his passport on the counter. The customs agent looks it over. Now he is the one who is confused. The agent has seen every passport there is to see, but he has never heard of the issuing country of the passport, a place called Tarad. Where is that? The man offers the agent a quizzical look and explains Tarad is on the border of Spain and France between Barcelona and Toulouse. Now the agent grows suspicious. This isn't, as he thought, a fledgling Middle Eastern country. The war may have changed some of the world's geography, but not this much. The security guard asks the man to come with him to get this sorted out. In a dank and humid back room, the man from Tarad sits in a metal chair, utterly baffled. The guard enters and places a long cylinder on the table. Unrolling it reveals a map of Europe. The guard then asks the man to point out his home country on the map. Without a second glance, the man jams his finger onto the border between France and Spain. So you're from Andorra, the guard asks. Shocked, the man lifts his finger to read the map under it. His eyes search for a country that isn't there. This is where Tourette should be, he explains, annoyed. He was born there and raised there. He jams his finger onto the table for emphasis in this exact place. He has never heard of Andorra. The man reaches into his suit pocket, causing the security guard to reach for his nightstick. But the man removes only a wallet, and he dumps the contents onto the metal table. Money from various countries flutters into a pile, followed by a checkbook. And finally, a driver's certificate, which the man shoves under the guard's nose. See, it is also issued by the country of Tarad. So it is. The guard takes the money, the checkbook, the passport, and the license, and turns to leave. What year is this map from, the man asks, still confused, but now growing angry. The security guard doesn't say anything and closes the door as he leaves the room. Later, the customs agent enters the immigration office to find the security guard on the phone. He waits while the guard finishes his call, reading the cover of the man's checkbook. The man on the checkbook, he is told, does not exist. They've double-checked. Yes, they are sure. The guard thanks the person on the phone and hangs up. Did you arrest him? the agent asks. Being confused isn't a crime, the guard replies. But... What if he's a spy? In 1954, the Second World War may be over, but the Cold War is in full swing. The security guard shrugs. Tomorrow, he will contact the research office. It's Japan's equivalent of the CIA, and they'll know what to do. Until then, he will detain the man at a nearby hotel with armed watchmen. The security guard tucks the man's passport and papers into his desk drawer and locks it shut. 
As the man from Tarad is escorted into a high-rise hotel room, he is still confused, but grateful for the cool air conditioning coming from inside. The guard tells the man that maybe a good night's sleep will help clear the confusion. Then, the security guard closes the door on the man from Tarad and never sees him again. The next day, the guard arrives to find the watchman still stationed at the door. An uneventful night, they report, he stayed in his room. Looking into the hotel room, the guard is shocked to find that the man is gone. He peers out the hotel window. There are no balconies on the 30th floor. A further extensive search brings up no evidence and no sign of the man. When agents from the research office arrive to question the man, the guard is at a loss. He explains what happened and unlocks the desk drawer to show the man's papers. But the papers are gone too, vanished as if in the thin air. Seventy years later, the man from Tarad remains a mystery. There is some speculation that the man is possibly from the future. But seven years from now or beyond, will something happen in Europe? Something that will shift borders and rename countries? Creating a country called Tarad? Maybe only time will tell. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did find it interesting, please make sure you subscribe. We'll have a new video about the paranormal every week. If you just discovered this channel, please make sure you check out our other channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash criminally listed. We also have a podcast about cold cases that were eventually solved called Criminally Listed Presents Into the Killing. You can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.